Hey guys, and welcome to another video. And this time I've got two computers that I need to look at. And they are two identical computers, two IBM personal computer XT model 286 PCs. Yep, that's right. An XT model 286. How strange is that? Well, the IBM personal computer XT model 286 is a 286 model that IBM released under the XT branding because it shares kind of the same case design as the XT models used to have. Uh, only this is a fully fledged AT system as it has a 286 CPU. Now, both units are virtually identical and they are pretty stock, uh, except for the fact that one has a VGA while the other has either MDA, CGA, or EGA. On the front, we have the IBM badges. We have stock uh, IBM disk drives. There's still room for an additional disk drive. And we have full height hard drives here, or at least full height hard drive front panels. Both panels contain the IBM badge, but one has a red LED and the other has a green LED. That's basically the only difference between these two PCs. Now the top one I got from a friend. It's not actually my PC. He brought it in for uh, repairs because he couldn't get the hard drive up and running. So we're going to take a look at that. And the bottom one is the 286 that I received with a whole bunch of other older computer stuff that I uh, showed in a previous video and I haven't turned it on yet so yeah it's going to be exciting to see what's going on with these two machines. Moving to the back nothing really exciting going on here we have the IBM 5162 badge which is the model number for the XT model 286. We have the power supply we have two expansion cards here and on the top one there only seems to be one Obviously, there's also a fixed disk adapter uh, inside, which doesn't have any external connectors. Now, the top computer is made in the UK. The bottom one is made in the US of A. So that's already a difference. Um, both accept the 200 volt uh, range that we have here in Europe. So that's fine. And in the expansion cards here, the bottom one seems to have an I.O. card with a serial and a parallel port and also has a video card, which has the you know, the typical two row uh, EGA, CGA or monochrome style connector together with a parallel port. Now the top one seems to have both a VGA and a two row style connector for video. So yeah, we'll need to open it up to see what is inside. And we'll start with the top one, which is coming from a friend slash subscriber here on the channel who had some issues with this machine in getting the hard drive up and running. This, the machine should be able to boot just fine, so I don't need to do any uh, investigation on that, and I shouldn't be worried about you know, exploding capacitors. But we need to look at the hard drive uh, and see what's going on there. So this is a 20 megabyte Type 13 MFM hard drive with the IBM branding here. We have a 1.2 megabyte disk drive. We have a standard 16-bit MFM controller card used to hook up the disk drive and the hard drive. We have a VGA card, power supply, and there's also a battery to save the PC settings. Now, I wanted to take a closer look at this 16-bit ISA uh, VGA card. So this is uh, using the Oak Technologies chipset, the OTI037C. And, you know, this is quite an interesting little card here. We have two BIOS chips. It's branded Hidaka. No idea what that is. There's one bank of memory, 256 kilobyte of video memory. There's a switch block here for the monitor selection. And we have two type of connectors here. We have a both a digital and an analog RGB connector. So we can hook up a VGA monitor, but we can also hook up EGA or monochrome monitors. So let's take a look at what happens when we start the machine. Power supply fan is kicking in, the hard drive is ramping up, so everything appears to be fine. And then at some point, the floppy disk will start to initialize, as you can hear now. And then normally you should see the LED of the hard drive blinking and it should do like a, a quick seek, but here nothing happens. 
Instead, you will see the following on the screen, which is a 1780 disk zero failure. Now let's take a look at what this error means. Now, if you have an IBM, you should know by now that the minus zero degrees.net site is an invaluable source of information regarding these old machines. And it has a page here dedicated to some post uh, on screen errors. And here we will find the 1780 error and the possible causes that might be the result of this error popping up on your screen. So during the computer's post, this page is talking about the 5170, but it also applies to the 5162. So here it will ask the disk controller to perform an initial diagnostic, which has passed, which is already good. And then it asks the controller to recalibrate the drive. And there something goes wrong. And it seems like a lot of things can go wrong. So here it talks about the control cable being missing, not seated properly, the drive select jumper on the hard drive in the wrong position, a twisted control cable being used instead of a straight floppy drive cable, uh, power issues, hard drive being faulty. So yeah, a lot of stuff can go wrong. I wanted to take a closer look at the hard drive. So I'm just gonna pull it out of the system here and take a closer look. So you have the beautiful IBM front badge with the red LED, type 13, 20 megabyte hard drive with an IBM label. And on the side here, it says WD25, IBM Japan. And this is not a Western Digital 25, but this is a Winchester Drive 25. A yeah, beautiful full height drive. I love these electronics here at the bottom. So we're gonna take a closer look at those to see if we can find something here that might be of interest. But before we do that, I wanna show you another drive from the other IBM, which is a Seagate ST225, a 20 megabyte hard drive also, but this time this is type two instead of type 13. So let me hook this one up, start the machine and see what it does. So as we power on the machine, we hear the power supply spinning up and also the hard drive, we get the memory count. And then after a while, we will hear the floppy drive initializing and take a good listen at what the hard drive does just after the floppy disk has done initializing. So we start with the floppy disk initializing. Did you hear that just before the beep? Let me play that again for you. So before the beep on the PC speaker, you can hear the hard drive seeking. Something we didn't hear on the other one. So here we have the Winchester drive and the Seagate drive sitting next to each other. And let's flip them around to take a look at the electronics at the bottom of the drives. And on most MFM hard drives, you will be able to spot two things. You will be able to spot a terminator, which is something that plugs into a certain socket or a header. And what you will also find is a set of jumpers or a switch block or a terminal block like this, which will indicate the drive select number. And here you can see that the drive select is set in the first position, which means that it's in DS0. Now, if we take a look at the other hard drive, which is the Seagate one, here we see the Terminator block on the bottom. And here the drive select can be selected using jumpers. So you have uh, a jumper here, which is set to a certain position, and that will be used to indicate the drive select. Now we need to look at the documentation of this hard drive to see where we need to put the jumper. Now on stason.org, I was able to find the documentation and find the pinout of this particular jumper block. And you notice that pin 13 and 14 is uh, closed using the jumper. And that means that the drive select is set to drive number two. Why are we talking about this drive select so much? Well, here you can see the control and the data cable of an MFM hard drive. Here, this is the control cable, which uses kind of a floppy style connector. This is the data cable. And notice that on the control cable, there is a twisted part in the cable, much like a floppy drive cable. 
And depending on whether you're using a flat control cable or a twisted control cable, you will need to set these drive select jumpers on the hard drive accordingly. So on a flat cable or straight through cable, the drive select needs to be set to the first drive select or DS0. Now on a twisted control cable, you need to set the drive select to drive select the second position or DS1. So these need to go hand in hand. So remember the dip shunt block that we had on our Winchester drive, which was set on the first position, meaning DS0. Well, we know now that the type of cable that we need for this type of uh, drive configuration is a straight through cable. And what type of cable did we have? Yes, we had a twisted control cable. So that was the issue. Now the dip shunt which is used on this Winchester drive is not something that we can change easily. It's not like we can set it to the second position very easily. We would need to cut through the first uh, position and then solder something on the second position which would be very inconvenient. So instead I just removed the dip shunt and created my own little jumper here from an old uh, heather and then uh, just inserted it in the second position so that I could continue using the existing uh, twisted cable and make it compatible with this hard drive. Because on a lot of these old IBMs the control and data cables of the hard drive as well as the floppy drive cables are all combined into this little package here so I didn't, didn't want to remove them. Now on a little side note, if you're thinking about uh, using a standard floppy drive cable as a control cable for an MFM hard drive, you do need to take into account that the twisted parts uh, are located in different positions. So you cannot use the twisted part, you could use the straight through part of a floppy drive uh, cable and let it act as a control cable. But now let's see what the system does as we have uh, the new drive select configuration in place on the original uh, IBM hard drive here. So we should see the disk drive initializing and then let's see what the hard drive will do. And there you go. You could see the red LED lighting up of the hard drive. So it did this little seek and it seems to be working a lot better now. So let's take a look at what's on the screen now. And what we get is another error. This time we get 1790, disk zero error. So let's return to minus zero degrees and scroll down to the error code. And here we see that the 1790 disk zero failure happens when the internal diagnostic succeeded, the recalibrate drive command succeeded, but as a controller attempts to read some of the sectors on the hard drive, it fails to do so. And this is typically caused because the hard drive isn't low level formatted. So that's the next thing we need to do. And for that, we're gonna be using the IBM Advanced Diagnostics Disk, a disk provided by IBM to do the setup of your PC. And now we're booting with the IBM Advanced Diagnostics disk, and we are greeted with this header here. First thing we need to do is to uh, say if we have already ran this program since connecting the battery and we haven't so we hit no and then we'll be prompted to set the date and the time of the machine we type yes to confirm and then enter to continue next we need to confirm the presence of a high capacity disk drive 1.2 megabyte which is okay we don't have a disk drive b the fixed disks or the hard disk, we have one installed. We need to enter the type. We need to make sure that we enter the correct type because entering a wrong type here will prevent us from formatting the drive correctly. So it's type two. Well, it's actually type 13, but I lost the footage of that one. So this is the footage of me doing the same thing using the Seagate hard drive. So my apologies for the confusion. So we confirm by pressing yes. It asks us if this is the primary display we're looking at. We have 640 kilobytes of memory. We don't have any expansion memory installed on this machine. And here we get this nice summary of all of the components in the system. So this is all correct. Now we need to do a reset. And after the reset, we will again 
enter the diagnostics menu and then we can start low level formatting the fixed disk which is something that we need to do before we can uh, format it using MS-DOS. So we're again in the advanced diagnostics and now we get this menu here that we didn't get before and this is because we have already configured the system. So now I will go into the system checkout sub menu where it will uh, investigate our system and display all of the items which are installed. And here we get this nice overview and I'm interested in the fixed disk. So I will ask it to run the tests one time select the option that we want to test and this is option number 17 which is the fixed disk and now I am going to go into the format menu which is number seven and the format menu allows us to do a conditional and unconditional format alongside service analysis and an interleaf change now to do a format you type two for unconditional format but you also need to specify the drive so we need to type two comma c in order to activate the menu now we get a warning that all of the data will be destroyed on the fixed disk. We get another warning. This is your last chance. So we hit yes. We don't have any defects to enter as the defect list on the hard drive is empty. And it will start formatting the drive now. So it will count down on the cylinders. Now I fast forwarded this a little bit, but after a couple of minutes, the low level format should be done and you should get this format complete message where you can hit enter to continue. Now to exit the diagnostics, you need to enter nine a whole bunch of times to get to the top level menu again, and then it will prompt for a reboot. So now after rebooting the computer with an MS-DOS boot floppy, we can check to see if there's a C drive and there won't be a C drive because we don't have any partitions yet. So we're going to be using FDisk to create a primary DOS partition. We're going to use the maximum available space to make this DOS partition, we need to do another reboot. And with the same MS-DOS boot floppy, we do FDisk again. We verify that the partition has been created 100%. It doesn't have a file system yet. So that means that when we try to access the C drive, we now get a C drive, but we are unable to read it, obviously, because it's not formatted yet. So we're gonna use the MS-DOS format command to format the hard drive. We're gonna use the slash S switch to copy the system files over to the hard drive so it's going to format the drive now and then copy all of the system files so that we are able to boot from the hard drive so i'm going to speed up this footage a little bit it doesn't take too long to format a 20 megabyte drive even on an old system like this and then it copies over the system files and then it should be done and present you a nice summary of the hard drive so 21 megabytes of total disk space 200 kilobytes used by the system files and now we should be able to reboot the system without any floppy disks inserted and it should boot right off the hard drive onto the c prompt so let's see if it does that so it's starting MSDOS from the hard drive it should prompt us for a date and a time so we can hit enter here this is just because we don't have an autoexec.bat and config.sys file here. We only have the command.com on hard drive, but this seems to be working just fine. So another IBM saved. Let's hook up the old IBM VGA CRT monitor, which goes pretty well with this model XT286. Really glad we were able to get this up and running again. So the hard drive is now doing its thing. The PC can boot from the hard drive. Everything is configured. Uh, PC is basically ready for use. So yeah, I hope the original owner will be happy again so that he can make full use of it now. And I hope you guys learned a thing or two. I know I did. So as always, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please consider giving it a thumbs up, uh, consider commenting, subscribing to the channel. I hope you stick around for part two where I'll be looking at the other IBM that I showed in the beginning, which also had its fair share of issues. And I'm also going to be looking at these two cards here, which were donated to me for repairs, which prevent the IBM from booting. So that will also be an interesting video, I think. So that's it for me for now. I hope to see you guys soon. Bye bye.